Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. My name is Melanie and I am one of the performance marketing specialists here at LiveRent. Today we have Megan Chomet, who is an investment property advisor and certified financial planner. Thank you for joining us today, Megan. Thanks so much for having me. Like you mentioned, I am a certified financial planner and I work exclusively with rental property owners and landlords. So I have a lot of information to share and I also have my feet in the mud as I own rental properties too. Awesome. And I just want to say, I love your reels on Instagram. My favorite one is that bit about you like buying some stuff for your business and like just goes back and forth and like who pays for it. And like, honestly, a lot of them are really hilarious. Um, and I also just wanted to do a quick intro for the new folks here about Live Rent. We are a rental platform designed for renters, landlords, property managers with solutions for every stage of your rental journey. So we help you digitize your entire rental process from start to finish. Um, so three weeks ago, we covered the renter's guide to getting a bigger tax return. So you can catch that on our YouTube channel. Um, but today it is all about our landlords and their guide to property tax deductions. Um, so we are going to be breaking it down for you in three parts. So the first part will be your tax 101, basic tax principles for landlords. Second part is the um, tax during the COVID-19. Third part, our tax tax to get a bigger return. So for the first part, it is more like an intro. You can think of it as your tax 101 class for landlords um, because we are going to be touching on all the basics that you need to know plus things that, you, um, things that you may not know, like rental versus business income and what share of ownership means. For the second part, it is going to be all about tax in the time of COVID-19. This might be the wildest tax year for landlords um, that they've ever had. So we're going to show you what's different this year. And we're gonna go over things like working from home expenses, uh, CERB, CRB, EI, and rent subsidies. And finally, in part three, we are going to be looking at everything else that can keep that can help you keep as much of your money money to you. Um, so we'll be looking at things like claimable expenses, including the ones that a lot of people tend to forget, bookkeeping tips, and more tax secrets. And then at the very end of the webinar, we're going to do our live Q and A, where Megan will be answering your questions about tax returns. So please make sure to enter your questions in the live chat on the right hand side of the screen throughout this webinar and we will get to them at the end. So before we start, we've just got some housekeeping things to do. First, the fun part, um, we are going to look at our audience and see who is with us today. So based on our Eventbrite registration survey, there are 2% of you guys that are renters, 91% of you are landlords, 4% are property managers and 3% are realtors. So welcome everyone. Um, Megan, what are your thoughts on our audience today? I think that everybody is going to walk away with a little bit more value and help for this upcoming tax season. For sure. And I was mentioning earlier, I think we really timed this webinar like perfectly just because it is tax time. Um, so guys, just to make the most out of your webinar experience today, please remember to turn off your ad lockers. And if you haven't yet, create an account so you can unlock the side panel features, which includes our giveaway draw. The live chat panel is your place to introduce yourself, let us know where you're from, ask us your questions um, for our Q&A, and it is on the right-hand side of your screen, and we do have LiveRent agents that will also be answering any immediate questions that you may have in our chat. We also have a giveaway happening. Um, you'll get a chance to win a $100 Amazon gift card, so in order to win this gift card, you can navigate to the giveaway panel on the right-hand side of this live stream complete the specified actions and click submit entry. So each completed action is an additional raffle entry. So you can have up to five entries in the raffle. Again, once you complete the action, please don't forget to hit submit entry. We will also be running some polls throughout the webinar. So you'll see those pop up on your screen and we're actually gonna get the first one started right now. So first question is, we wanna know how confident are you to do your own taxes? I know I'm not, hence why I have an accountant, but we'll see if I'm going to try next year. This is actually a really great question to start us off, so make sure to cast your vote and we will re reveal the results later on. Um, so let's get started on our first section, which is our Tax 101 Basic Tax Principles for our Landlords. 
Um, Megan, my question for you is about the tax implications of being a landlord. So can you give us a general overview of what landlords should look out for? So that's a really good question. When you do have rental properties, it is like buying a business. So each property is its own separate entity and should have its own set of bookkeeping and paperwork. If you want to be able to claim expenses, you also need to be able to prove to prove that you paid for those expenses. Expenses. So keeping track of all of those receipts and all of those invoices are really important because if you do get audited, sending in a credit card statement or a bank statement showing that you paid for the expenses is not good enough. Unfortunately, you need to have the itemized receipt and having everything separated. So for example, if you went to Home Depot to buy some repairs and maintenance expenses for your rental property, but there's a bag of chips on there and it's a chocolate bar. Unfortunately, those are not eligible <laughs> deductions for your rental property. So it's really important not only to keep everything, but also to keep things separate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that definitely sounds a lot more complicated than just doing like a personal tax return, right? Um, I'm actually curious about how landlords can declare the money they earn from the property. So is that considered a rental income or a business income? And what is the difference between the two? So the difference between the two is that, that rental income is, is reported on its own separate form. Business income is reported on its own separate form. For business income, or sorry, if we go back to the rental property, if you think that you are providing long-term housing for your tenants and that is it, then that is what rental the rental income form is for. If you provide services above and beyond just the housing, so examples of this might be uh, Airbnbs because they provide the housing, but they also provide cleaning services, a nice bottle of wine, some snacks, maybe use of their kayak or bikes. That is more than just rental income, that's business income. So they need to be reported on the proper form. Rental income goes on a form called the T776 and business income, which would be everything above and beyond just providing housing, gets reported on the form T2125. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely good to know. Um, so my next question is about the share of ownership. So can you talk a little bit about what that means and what people need to know about it? Yeah, so when you go through on the tax program or with your accountant, one of the questions that gets asked on the rental income form is if you own this property with anybody. So if you do own the property, let's say for example, with your partner or spouse, typically you report this as joint 50-50 just like if you decided to not be partners and spouses with this person, how it would get divided between the two of you. This amount is not static and does not change. So if it's more beneficial for you to report uh, a 20%, 80% split just for tax purposes, that's not something that, you, that is available to you. You need to keep it consistent at 50%. 50. So this would go for spouses or family members, unless there is a written agreement saying um, that person A owns 20% and person B owns 80%. And if there were was a sale of the property, that's also how the funds would have been divided. There's a legal agreement for that. Um, and then if you own the property 100% in your own name, then the income is 100% yours. Okay, that definitely makes a lot a lot of sense. Um, it's actually helped us lay the foundation for our next part here. Um, so I can't take notes right now, but while I am talking to you, but we are going to be posting this webinar on our YouTube channel um, it's after this event. So you can watch it, watch it back if you miss anything or if you have to duck out of our webinar early to attend to your tenants. Um, so please make sure to subscribe to our channel. You can click the pop-up that's coming on the screen right now that will lead you to our channel. So 
let's check the poll results right now and see how confident people are about doing their 2020 taxes. Um, so based on the poll, 60% of you guys voted that you know enough but want to know more, and 24% of the audience voted that they have no idea what they're doing. I feel you, the 24% of you. <laughs> uh, Megan, what are your thoughts on the um, poll results? I think that that's a pretty good depiction of the general population. Um, and there's a lot of great tools out there and resources to help that 24%. For sure, for sure. Um, and as you all know, last year was a very challenging time for many of us. And before we dive into the next section on how to file taxes um, or for any rent subsidies received or how to file for non-payment of rent, um, for our second poll, um, we just want to know how did COVID-19 impact rental payments um, received for you? So this brings us to the next question. Um, so during the taxes in the time of COVID-19, and how unique of a tax year 2020 is proving to be. Um, Megan, can you give us a quick overview of what COVID-19 meant for landlords in 2020 and what are the implications that they have on their tax return? I think that there's a stronger pull for people right now to get their taxes done. So there's I feel two camps of people. There's people who are a little bit more relaxed in terms of the deadline and getting things filed on time. And then there's people who have already submitted their stuff. They have a checklist, they have a folder, they're very organized. And even if you fall in the camp of more relaxed and maybe not as organized, there's still the added incentive and pressure for you to get your stuff done because should you need any COVID relief uh, options, you need to have your tax return completed in order to be eligible. So that is putting more pressure on every tax <laughs> platform. So whether it's waiting on hold with CRA or trying to find the right um, software that meets your needs, I think that there's just a lot more traffic in terms of um, finding solutions. Mm -hmm, for sure. Speaking of CRA, I was on hold with them for about five hours. So there you go, guys, get on that. <laughs> um, and with COVID-19 and its economic implications, there were a lot of people in, who suddenly were out of work and many couldn't even afford to pay rent. So if a tenant wasn't able to pay because of COVID-19, what should landlords do and how will this reflect on their tax return? Yeah, that's a good question. So if your tenants weren't able to or didn't pay rent, or maybe they moved out and your property was vacant when it normally wouldn't have been vacant, how that gets reflected is in your income line. So let's use real numbers. Let's say, for example, you make $1,000 a month in rent. And in 2020, some of those months were either not paid or vacant. So instead of claiming the full $12,000 in income that you would have typically claimed, what you're going to do is you're just going to claim whatever you received. So if your tenant paid you $8,000 in 2020, that's what you claim. If your tenant maybe paid you nothing and they provided you IOUs saying they will pay you back when they can, you claim nothing, and when you received the rent, you claim it then. Okay. Um, and what if, what about if um, you got a rent subsidy from the government? Um, was that a freebie, or do we need to tax it, and how do we go about doing that? So the uh, rental subsidies are taxable, meaning you do have to claim those as taxable income, and it has to be before the end of the related claim period. Okay. Um, so this was definitely a unique program that we haven't seen before. So again, guys, um, let us know if you have any questions and make sure to pop those over on the live chat. Um, so just going to check on our second poll now and see how did COVID-19 impact rental payments received. Um, let's see here. We're just waiting on some results here. One second.
Okay, so 25% of the audience voted that um, their tenant and themselves worked out a repayment, pa repay repayment plan. I can't talk today. Um, and 57% of the audience voted that it did not impact any rental payments that they have received. So, I mean, that, that's some good news there for the 57% of you. Um, Megan, any thoughts? I think that from my own rental property, that really is a pretty good depiction of what happened for me as well. So my tenants were able to collect those CERB benefit pack packages, which helped them to pay their rent on time. And then there were some that we just worked out something between the two of us mm -hmm. because it's COVID and we're going to, we're all in this together. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, can you actually tell us how these programs are um, going to affect the taxes this year? So we do have the CERB, the CRB, and EI to think about. So how does that change? So that's a good question. And right now, as we're in the, the weeds of tax season, and some of us who have collected CERB are trying to submit our taxes, we may in the past have gotten refunds that helped us out this spring, and this spring we are actually having to owe. And that's because when CERB was first released and put into the pocketbooks of the people who needed it the most, it was done so quickly that it was just provided and no tax was taken off. Then when a reevaluation was done and they did the CRB, it did take into account taxes, which was very helpful, but it only taxed you at 10%. So the catch here is that if in 2020, you are in a higher tax bracket than 10%, there, you will have to owe taxes on that income that you received. So typically, just like when you have an employer paying you, they take off those federal and provincial taxes off of each paycheck so that you don't really notice it at tax time. So that might be a surprise for some this tax season when you're used to getting a refund, but this year you owe. Mm -hmm. For sure. And I do like to keep things a little bit positive whenever I can. And I know that COVID-19 has brought a lot of challenges, but I also like to think that it's also brought some opportunities for us. Um, so there are, uh, are there any new credits or deductions that landlords can take advantage of this year? And how do they go about doing that? So the big one that will apply to many Canadians is the work from home uh, tax deduction. There's going to be two ways that you can claim this. There's going to be a simplified version and there's going to be a detailed version. So if you worked for more than 50% of the time from home for at least four weeks in a row, and it has to be due to COVID, then you qualify for these benefits. So for the simplified version, you simply put on your tax return how many days you worked from home. So if you worked 100 days from home in 2020, you're entitled to $2 a day for 100 days, which would be a $200 tax deduction. The catch here is that there is a maximum number of days, which is 200 days. So the maximum tax deduction is $400. The other way that you can claim this work from home tax deduction is the detailed way. And if you want to claim this way, you have to same criteria have worked from home for more than 50% for four weeks in a row due to COVID. You also have to get a special form from your employer called the T2200. As a tax preparer, I've seen a lot of employers just providing this out to their employee, regardless if it's if it's more beneficial for you to claim the detailed way or the simplified way, just because they aren't your tax preparer and they don't know. So there are a lot of employers that are just issuing it anyways, but what you need to have in addition to that T2200 is you need to know the square foot of your home, the square foot of your office. You need to have um, invoices or receipts for all of your utilities that you're gonna that you're entitled to claim, this is electricity, rent, heat, water, condo fees, internet. You're also eligible to claim small, minor repairs and maintenance. So not constructing your office, 
but maybe some of the cleaning supplies and light bulbs that are connected to that new space that you're using more often than you normally would. And then th things like paper and supplies that you would normally get in your office, if your employer is not compensating you for those items, you're able to use those for the work from home tax deduction as well. Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. I'm definitely going to try to do the detailed way this year just to help me get my maximum refund. So we'll see. Um, with that in mind, how else do we make sure that our community of landlords are aware of how to maximize their returns? Mm -hmm. So you are eligible to claim a variety of deductions. So things like all of the utilities that you pay for, all of your repairs and maintenance for maintaining the property, um, really anything that you are reinvesting into your rental property, you can use it to offset your taxes. So if you use a professional, if you use a landscaper, um, if you pay the condo fees, all of those things are deductible expenses for you and you shouldn't overlook them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and well, we're about to dive into how to do that in just a second. But before we do that, we are going to run another poll. Um, so guys, let us know, are you looking to do some upgrades or renovation to your property or properties this year? Um, Megan, did you do any re renovations this year or last year? Yeah, it's funny because we actually had in the winter made a list of things that we wanted to do in some of our rental properties and then COVID hit. So we weren't actually able to do as many um, renovations as we liked until the summer. So I feel like there was a lot of activity in the summer, but a big lull. So everything kind of piled up. Yeah, for sure. And while we are thinking about our investment properties, I did want to point out that our team came together to make an offer for any landlords or property managers in our audience today, just to help you maximize your return of investment for your properties. Um, we want to give you an exclusive offer for one of our featured listing packages. I'm just going to give you a quick walkthrough of what a featured listing looks like on LiveRent and how it can get your units filled faster, especially when it is a renter's market like right now and even in Toronto as well. So listings that are featured uh, get up to 300% more views and 65% more applications. So in order to redeem that 50% off our featured listing packages, there's two ways that you can do this. Um, so you can either click on the redeem now button popping up on your bottom left corner uh, screen right now your email will pop up with a pre-filled subject line and message and then you hit send and one of our reps will get in touch with you or a second way you can do this is you can type like the three dollar sign um, figures in our live chat and we'll get one of our um, team members to get in touch with you as well so Guys, just to clarify, there are two ways that you can claim this 50% off. The first one is to click the redeem now on the bottom uh, screen of your, um, at the bottom of your screen. And the second part is just to type in the dollar sign figures in our live chat. So that is one way you can get your units filled and keep your money coming into your pockets and into your house. So let's jump back into my favorite part of the tax webinar, which is all about maximizing that tax return. So. It's no secret that everyone wants to keep as much of their money as possible, not just to increase their ROI, but also because who doesn't like money? Um, we are heading into our last section of the webinar, which I like to call the tax hacks. So it's really more like some of the things that you need to know to help you um, get the biggest of your tax return as possible. So just an overview of what I'm going to be asking Megan today, um, we'll be talking about claimable expenses, mortgage payments, common expenses that people tend to overlook or forget, current expenses versus capital expenses, and bookkeeping tips and some final tax tips. So let's cut right through it. So Megan, can you talk about claimable expenses and deductible expenses? What does that mean and how how landlords can use it to their advantage? So it's really important that you don't forget any of these claimable deductions because the more expenses that you forget, the more money you're leaving on the table. So all of those receipts that are in your glove box or in a 
Ziploc bag or in a safe spot, it's really important to go track down all those safe spots and put everything together. There are some expenses that are a little bit easier to track down than others. Those are gonna be expenses that are automatic. They're the same thing, they're the same amount every month and they're a little bit easier if you can't find the invoice receipt, then you can call them up and say, I'm missing this number. Can you just um, send me, email me, or how can I get about getting this document? So that's gonna be things like in insurance, your interest that you've paid on any debt that are associated to your rental properties, professional services. So if you had to reach out to a paralegal or an accountant or a professional cleaner, any of those professional services, you are totally eligible to claim their cost. Office expenses, that could be things like a receipt book or printer ink or paper, um, a log book for your vehicle, repairs and maintenance. That's the biggest pain in the butt one that I see is the repairs and maintenance because it's little slips for changing a lock or getting some paint or all those Home Depot receipts. Um, and then all of the utilities that you pay as a landlord. So it's not utilities that the tenant pays. There are sometimes utilities that um, the tenant will put in their name, but if you pay hydro, um, electricity, heat, water, all of those utilities, you are 100% eligible to claim those as a write-off. Okay, and what about mortgage payments? Are those deductible? That's a good question. So mortgage payments, you aren't actually able to deduct the full mortgage payment, but you are eligible to deduct any interest that you incurred in that mortgage payment. So if you have a line of credit or credit cards or a mortgage that is associated to the property and there's interest there, you're able to claim that interest amount. And for mortgages, at the in December, they always issue an annual um, mortgage statement and it will show you right on there how much interest was charged over the course of the year so that you don't have to go and look through every month and see, figure out because interest is going to change month, month by month. So that will be on your annual mortgage statement. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, so deducting interest, but not the actual mortgage payment. Mm -hmm. um, so now that we've been talking about expenses, I want to know um, what are some secret or hidden expenses that people forget to claim, but they are actually eligible to do so? Yeah, so I did go over briefly some of the expenses like insurance, um, interest, professional services, office supplies, repairs and maintenance, and all those utilities. So if you're forgetting any of those, don't. <laughs> like I said, you're leaving money on the table. Sometimes it's really overwhelming to manage your own personal finances and then also remember everything that you're paying for in the rental property. Um, but the more often that you track everything, the more familiar you're going to get with tracking all those things. Some of the things that I see people forget are things like property management, which can be a really big, um, it can be a really big expense for landlords. And then there are some common um, costs that come up that they're not per se a tax deduction, but people forget to claim to consider them when they're looking at rental properties. And that's that are that is things like vacancy and capital expenditures. Okay. Yeah, that definitely makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm going to ask you more about capital expenditures in just a moment. Um, I can definitely see the live chat is super busy today, which is awesome. So keep those questions coming in, guys. Um, we are going to try to get back to them at our Q&A, and don't forget to enter the giveaway if you haven't already. So we're just going to check our poll results from our last question here. So we did ask if you guys are looking to renovate your property or properties this year, and 57% of the audience voted they, they have done some minor renovations, and 4% of the audience did do a lot of uh, major renovations. So, Megan, do you have any thoughts on this? I don't think we're that surprised, are we? 
No, I think it's really pretty typical that we're kind of staying out of other people's living spaces at the moment. Mm -hmm. And you can explain, and can you actually explain um, capital expenditures for someone who's never heard of this term before? And how are capital expenses different from current expenses? Yeah, so there are two different kinds of expenses when it comes to your rental property. There are current expenses. This is things like repairs and maintenance. It's pretty much expenses that keep your property maintained. Then on the other side of the equation, there are things called capital expenses. And these are expenses that provide a lasting benefit or advantage to the property. And they're considered to be adding value to the property. So they could be things like improving the roof or um, putting on more durable siding. They're like big projects. Another thing where there's sometimes some confusion between current expenses and capital costs is if you're renovating or just sprucing up a property to sell it or to improve it to make it more rentable, it sometimes feels like that wasn't really a repair and a maintenance or because it was it is adding value, but there wasn't actually a tenant in the building while you were doing it. So that's kind of some rules of thumb. If there was not a tenant in there while you were sprucing it up to sell it or rent it out, that's a capital cost. So big jobs are capital. Those jobs aren't deducted. They're actually added to the value of your home. So in the year that they happen, they're not a taxable event. And if you rent rooms or an area in your home, you'll only be worried about current expenses. So these are things like repairs and maintenance because capital costs don't really apply to you because of a term called the primary residence exemption, meaning that when you sell your property, you have to report to CRA that you sold your primary residence but it isn't a taxable event as long as you've never claimed something called CCA or depreciation. So maybe this would be a conversation you should have with your accountant, um, but I would never recommend ever, never, ever claiming depreciation in a property that you also live in. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, it definitely sounds like you get this question a lot, maybe. Um, so one of the final questions I do have for you before we start to wrap up soon and head into our Q&A um, is the last of the heavy tax questions, and it is about losses. So mm -hmm. how can you claim a loss? Like, if your rental expenses were more than your rental income for 2020, how do you claim that on your taxes? Yeah, that's a good question. So when you're filling out the form for a rental property, it's the form T776, your program is going to walk you through it or your accountant will help you calculate it and it will automatically tell you the loss number. And this loss number now just gets applied and taken out of your total income. One important thing to note is CRA does not like to see a consistent loss on your rental property because that is a red flag. So if your rental property is consistently losing money, then they may audit you. Okay. Yeah, that's definitely good to know for everyone in an audience who are new landlords or had to do a lot of work in their properties in the last year. Um, so before we move into our q and I'm just curious to hear about bookkeeping and how people can hack bookkeeping to make tax season go more smoothly. For bookkeeping, I always recommend to stick to one method. So if you are more comfortable tracking things digitally, whether it's on a software or a Google Drive or some sort of platform, do everything in that platform. If you're more comfortable using paper and you like touching things and putting things in folders and organizing, then stick with that method. Um, trying a hybrid of some things 
being paper and some things being digital really is a recipe for disaster and you're never really sure where to look. The other tip that I like to give is get an email address for each property. So if you have a property at um, 123 King Street, go ahead, I, I almost guarantee nobody has that email, go ahead and grab it, get 123 King Street at email.com and you can, when you, when you book software, when you go to Home Depot and all of those things, you just get it sent to 123 King Street instead of it getting lost in the shuffle of your own personal inbox. Which if you're like me, there's that little red notification that has a astronomical number on it and things will just get lost. I also recommend that people do a one day catch up every month. I like to recommend doing it on the second or the third so that you get to see the rent payment come through and then you can make sure that all of your expenses and all of match all of your receipts. So it's kind of like you got a job to do, but you get to the reward, <laughs> the rent payment coming through. And when you can set everything up auto pay. So if you're at the beginning of your landlord journey, there may not be you know, the, the finances in that account yet. So you like kind of manipulating with the numbers and paying things when you can. But once you have a solid cushion in that bank account, set up all of your expenses to be automatically paid. Mm -hmm. For sure. That makes a lot of sense. And I, we definitely think alike. Um, using just one method to keep everything organized and in one place is super valuable, especially for those busy landlords and property managers. So here at LiveRent, we do have that same approach. So we make we made solutions for every step of the rental process, and it is 100% contactless and paperless. So for example, instead of checking emails, texts, and voicemails, you can keep all the communication between you and your tenants all in our platform. So our chat timeline feature is also where you where you send your contract to sign, as well as it, so it's all there for you for your uh, security. Um, and it's also in stored so you don't have to print, file, and shave down things uh, on your in your inbox or like search it up on your Google try to try to figure it out. Um, we've seen also a lot of property managers just love these features because it helps them save time by keeping things organized and having everything they need in one platform ready to go for them. So you can use LiveRent like it just to list your properties if you really want to, but you can also just bring your whole entire rental process on board, just like Megan's one method for bookkeeping. It definitely makes things um, a lot more easier. Um, and I did want to note coming soon, we will be launching a rental Dropbox feature where you can store all of your rental related documents like itemized receipts, contracts, whatever that may be, everything in one place. I think that this is going to be so valuable for all the landlords for saving so much time in looking and digging in all of their safe places. Yeah, for sure. Especially the ones who have that hybrid model right now. We're going to try to just get you to stick to one for now. <laughs> Um, again, Megan, thanks so much for talk taking the time to talk to us and answering all of our questions here. I've definitely been grilling you a lot today. Um, I know that our audience wants to do the same, so I'm just going to let them have their turn. Um, so we're going to be taking some questions now, guys. Um, so for everyone who have pre-submitted the questions before the event, um, and we're going to try to get as many of the questions in the live chat, as, as many as we can as possible, um, given the time limit that we do have. Um, we also just wanted to mention that the giveaway contest is now closed, so stay tuned for um, the winner after our Q&A session. So let's get started on our first question. So we have a question here from Colin, and Colin is asking, how do you claim updates to a strata building such as elevator upgrades? So elevator upgrades would fall into the big job, so that wouldn't be claiming an expense, it would be a capital cost. So it doesn't get claimed against your income. It gets added to the value of the property. Okay. Um, next question here is from Nick. Um, 
Nick is in our live chat today. Hey, Nick. Um, and he's asking, what are the cons of having three properties under one entity? So an example of that is like under a sole propriety, uh, propriety business. Okay, so if I'm understanding the question right, I'm thinking in terms of you, own, you as a sole proprietor own three rentals all under your name. In terms of the cons, it could be tax situations. So you're not able to split this income with your partner or spouse. Also, um, there's some tax savings opportunities by holding rental properties in business corporations instead of under um, yourself as a sole proprietor. So the cons would really be tax related in terms of you can't split the income with somebody. It's all got to be reported on your own tax return. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then another question here, um, can you deduct travel costs for showing? Yeah, you absolutely can deduct travel. The travel is one of those, um, I like to call them pain in the butt because you are able to claim the kilometers that you drive to your rental property, whether it's to maintain it, do showings. If you are trying to claim driving and you get audited, CRA is going to request something called a log book. And what they wanna see in this log book is the number on your odometer, January 1st, an itemized list of every single time you drove that vehicle, what the beginning kilometers was, what the ending kilometers was, and the purpose, whether it was for the rental or for personal, and then the ending kilometer on December 31st. So it is a little bit more intense, um, but you are absolutely eligible to claim it. Okay. That, that that really does sound intense. Um, so going on to our next question here from our live chat audience, Raquel. Uh, Raquel is asking if using a tradesperson who is quote, quote, off the books or for any reason can issue a receipt, but you write them a check or send them an e-transfer for payment, is that is that a legit legitimate way for a receipt or not? Typically, CRA wants a receipt and they want it itemized. So they want to know what the company was, what their business number is, and what the amount that was charged for what. So an e-transfer really isn't acceptable payment in terms of claiming it. The other thing to consider is that whoever was providing the service, that they're not at an arm's length, which means I needed some work done at, you know, 123 King Street. And so I asked my brother or my husband to help me out and I'm going to pay you X number of dollars because they are within arm's length of me. I am not able to deduct that expense, even if they are an L a sole proprietor or whatever. It's just um, it's not it's not good practice. Okay, got you. And we're just going to do a quick little um, lightning round here. So you just shout out if it's a capital expense or a current expense, um, because we do have a few of these questions in our live chat. Um, okay. So first one, um, if you replace a furnace, is that a capital expense or a current expense? That is capital. Okay. Um, Nelly is asking, a fence repair was required due to a storm. Is that a capital or maintenance? Maintenance. Um, so Scott is asking if the fridge or dishwasher is broken, is that then deductible? That's capital. Okay. Um, another question here. If I buy a used appliance for repair required, is that capital? If there's a receipt? Yes. Another good rule of thumb. I know this is supposed to be lightning, but another good rule of thumb is if the expense is under $400, it could be current. Okay, 
That's a, that was a trick question there. <laughs> um, so we're just jumping onto our normal questions now. Um, Teresa is asking, um, what types of renovation renovation expenses are deductible against the rental income? Okay, I got lots of these because I do renovations all the time. <laughs> so if you needed to um, fix a sink, if you needed to check for um, leaky something, if you needed to provide mouse traps or any type of pest control, if you um, provided your tenant with some paint to fix things up while because they put some um, pictures up on the wall. Um, I mean, there's so many. Putting up a mailbox, replacing a mailbox, light bulbs, like um, someone said in our chat, updating like not updating but fixing a fence because of wear and tear mm -hmm. changing the locks i mean i could go on and on for days there's tons of repairs and maintenance when it comes to rental properties just like there is in your own personal house okay got you and we're just doing our last question here um this is from dave so he's asking how much can you claim um an accountant filing you Sorry, how much can you claim accountant filing your taxes if you have rental properties? Good question. So if your accountant charges you $5 to do your tax return for your rental, you get to claim $5. If your accountant charges you $2,000 to do your tax filing, you get to you get to claim $2,000. <laughs> So whatever the receipt says for your accountant, that's a professional service and that's what you get to claim against your rental properties. Awesome. So that pretty much wraps up our Q&A session. So for any other questions that we did not get a chance to address, Megan will connect with you via email. Um, so we're actually ready now to announce our raffle winners. So we don't have a drum, so I'm just going to pretend we're doing a drum roll. Um, so our giveaway winner is Warren Muir. So congratulations, you have won our $100 Amazon gift card. So um, we will be connecting with you shortly just to just so you know how to claim that prize. Um, so thank you again, Megan, for joining me today. It has been super informative. I can tell like every single one of us have learned so much, even myself. Um, it's been such a pleasure uh, talking to you this morning or afternoon at your time. Um, so please let our audience know where can they find you? How can they slide into your DMs? How can they connect with you? Watch your reels. <laughs> My favorite place to hang out is on Instagram. My handle is Megan CFP. And I promise I'm the only Megan Chomut on the planet. So if you Google my name, Megan Chomut, my website, my email, all of the social platforms will come up. Awesome. Amazing. So thank you again, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. And we will catch you again on our next Live Talk. Definitely follow us for more um, rental-related updates. And for now, we'll see you soon. Bye.